You're listening to the Hog Beat Hour with Andrew Hutchinson, Alex Trader, and Mason Choate on ESPN Arkansas and HitThatLine.com. Now, here's your host, Mason Choate. Welcome to the Hog Beat Hour. I'm your host, Mason Choate, joined by Andrew Hutchinson and Alex Trader of HogBeat.com. Uh, we got a lot to get to today. We're talking about a visit, a visitor on campus for the Razorback football team. We're going to talk about some NCAA possible NCAA rule changes. Uh, we're going to talk Razorback baseball. We just got a lot to get to. It is the off season, so it's not as busy, but we still got stuff to talk about. So let's lead off with this visitor who's on campus, a wide receiver transfer. Hutch, tell us what you know about him. And I believe you said you just found out about it before we started recording. So nobody expect him to be an expert on it. Well, I know a little bit. I know enough to be dangerous. Uh, this kid's name is Matt Landers. Uh, he's a transfer from Toledo. I know that may not get you super excited, but before he was at Toledo, he was at Georgia. So he is a, a former SEC player, uh, of course, with uh, being at Georgia. He was a class of 2017 recruit, so he was there for a couple of years while Sam Pittman was there. So there's kind of that connection uh, so it makes a lot of sense. Arkansas wants to add another receiver in the portal. Sam Pittman has not uh, hidden that fact. He has been very open with, with what he wants to add. And uh, this seems like a very solid add. I mean, this is a guy that had uh, 20 catches for 514 yards and five touchdowns last year at Toledo. That was his only year at Toledo. That's in the max. So who knows kind of the level of competition, but that's 25, over 25 yards a catch. So seems like he was a big play guy. Uh, he was a, a 2017 recruit, as I said. So he's going to be in his sixth year of college football. He's using that extra year um, from COVID. So uh, he's got, uh, he'll be a super senior this year. So just one year of eligibility remaining. Uh, but we, we should have more on his visit later. Hopefully uh, by the time you're, hopefully by the time you're watching or listening to this, you'll be able to go over to hogbeat.com and and read a full recap on how his visit went uh, to see if uh, he, he liked it and you know if he could uh, potentially be committing to Arkansas sooner rather than later. That would be a, a big-time addition for Arkansas just from a, a depth standpoint. Right now, the, the wide receiver room is relatively thin. There's not a whole lot of guys. There's still room for, for people to make a move. Um, I, I, if you remember, I uh, wrote my uh, spring superlatives piece right after spring ball, after that spring showcase. And my biggest concern right now is the wide receiver room. So if you can add somebody that could contribute this year, he doesn't have to be a Traylon Burks. Uh, there's very few of those. I mean, it's, I don't think Arkansas is going to get Jordan Addison from Pitt. Uh, but if you can get just a, a contributor at the wide receiver spot, I think that would be really big for the Razorbacks. Yeah, I mean, Hutch, you hit on it there. Alex, you were talking about it, too, before we started recording, how after that spring game, it, it seems like Arkansas could probably use another wide receiver, especially in the SEC, especially when you have a quarterback like K.J. Jefferson. You need to get that guy weapons. So um, in your opinion, Alex, how key would it be to get a guy, um, not only a, a transfer who's played college football, but as Hutch said, a guy who's been in a program like Georgia, he knows Sam Pittman, and he made an impact at a program like Toledo, um, which it, they're not a power five team, but I mean, they beat Arkansas a couple of years ago. Yeah, I think it's huge. And what we're seeing now with college football is love it or hate it. The transfer portal is bringing in a lot of these one year kind of hired guns where you're going to find a position of need that you maybe didn't hit and that, or you're working on and recruiting, um, but they're not quite there yet. And I think what we're seeing right now with Arkansas bringing in Jaden Hazelwood and potentially bringing in Landers is that you need depth at that wide receiver position. Um, like Hutch mentioned, big seems like a big play guy, had multiple games averaging 30 plus yards um, for Toledo and was able to put up a really nice bowl performance over 150 yards there. So uh, if Arkansas is scouting them, you saw what they did with Traylon Burks, that they seem to have a feel for the position. Um, and, and you just have to hope that he matches with the offense and provides that extra option for KJ. So I think this talking about this wide receiver, I think we could transition into some of these uh, proposed rule changes for um, the NCAA Hutch. The, the, there's a two year waiver for unlimited recruiting classes. Am I reading that right? And if I am, just go ahead and kind of explain that because that helps with scholarships, right? 
Yeah, I think we've touched on this a little bit the last uh, couple of times we've talked, just because it is such a such a challenge right now for for Arkansas and for co- coaches and teams across the country. In that, right now you only can sign twenty five players per year, and that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you've got thirty spots open; you can only sign twenty five, and the other five you have to fill with walk ons. And we saw that this year, Arkansas. Uh, just recently put, uh, I think, three guys on scholarship, Jackson Woodard, Nathan Bax, and uh, Harper Cole. All three guys are, are probably, I mean, you could say deserving of a scholarship, but they they were you know only given those really because they're, they couldn't go to anyone else. I mean, they had to fill the spot somehow, and that's how they did it. You know, a few years back uh, with Chad Morris, uh, everyone likes to forget that tenure, but there was, I think it may be his second year, they had to give like seven scholarships to walk-ons and like a couple of them were not deserving guys. Like, I mean, Jackson Woodard, for example, he's in the two deep and he's probably going to play a lot on special teams and maybe even a little bit on defense. Uh, same thing with Nathan Bax because he's a special teams contributor pretty heavily and also is going to maybe contribute some on, on offense as a tight end. That that deserves a scholarship in my opinion, because you've got, you know, four string quarterbacks that are on most teams that will never sniff the field that are on scholarship. If you're on the field, even if it's just special teams, I think you deserve uh, that scholarship. And uh, when Chad Morris was here, a couple of those guys that he gave a scholarship to never sniffed the field. Like I couldn't even tell you their names because they were just guys that did not contribute. Like they hardly even did anything in practice. And so it, to me, That's what you want to avoid is having to do that. And then, of course, you don't have unlimited walk-ons that you can give scholarships to. Uh, Kansas is running into this problem famously in that they they would have like 55 guys on scholarship and they can't they can't replace all that. They can't get up to 85 man limit. Eliminating that requirement, that cap of 25 per year would allow coaches to fill their roster, uh, be able to go get replacements from the portal. While also, you know, if they lose guys, you know, because you're going to have guys transfer every year. That's just part of football now. Uh, so it, it, to me, it's a common sense, no brainer type of rule change. And hopefully uh, it's not just a, a two year waiver. Hopefully they make it a permanent deal. Yeah, that was going to be my next question was it's as of now, it's a two year waiver, but it would be better to have it as a permanent deal. They're making it a two-year waiver because of the COVID stuff, right? Because you have a bunch of guys with their sixth year trying to get into places, but people only have limited scholarships. Is that why it's that two-year waiver? I think that's part of it because you still got a bunch of guys that are using their sixth year that are taking up those scholarship spots. Uh, You also have it uh, in in using their scholarships by transferring elsewhere, kind of like, you know, Matt Landers potentially with Toledo transferring for his sixth year. Uh, but you also have, uh, I think the trial period is also to kind of see how it goes. I think there's a little bit of a concern by, by some that this will lead to coaches running guys off like, Hey, we don't want you anymore. Please leave. And we're going to replace you with somebody better. Uh, you don't, you don't really want that happening. Cause that's, that's kind of tough. Uh, I don't know how you avoid it, but they're usually, you could talk to a kid and be like, Hey man, you're not in our plans, you know, for, uh, moving forward, you're going to be buried on the depth chart, never going to get on the field. You may want to transfer like that. That's, that's a, a perfectly fine conversation, but you don't want it happen where they're like, Hey, we're yanking your scholarship. You have to get in the portal. Uh, that's what you want to avoid. And if you have unlimited scholarships to, to you know, bring in guys, who's to stop a a coach from doing that, like running off their entire scout team to replace them with better players. Uh, That's kind of what they want. They want to kind of see how it plays out over these two years. And then if it goes well, then I think they would adopt it, you know, full, you know, full time, or if they need to tweak it or adjust it or whatever, they have that opportunity to do so. Okay. And then also another part of this, uh, this rule thing that they came out with, what was it? It, it was the, uh, the conference championship games. Hutch, you were talking about possibly having pods in the SEC. They're making it, basically they're making it to where for the conference championship game, it doesn't have to be like the top team from each division. And you might even just get rid of divisions as a whole, right? 
Yeah. So right now, uh, you know, previously, uh, several years ago, uh, whenever the Big 12 kind of imploded and they got down to 10 teams, uh, the before that, the rule was you had to have divisions. And that's why you had like, you know, a Big 12 North and a Big 12 South. You've got the SEC East and the SEC West. You've got the the legends and leaders in the Big Ten or whatever they want. They, I know they've changed it since then, but uh, that's that's why you have those is because the champion of each division will meet in the championship game. Uh, they changed that for the Big 12 because they didn't have enough teams to have divisions. They just changed it to where if you play around Robin's schedule, like the Big 12 did uh, with a, a nine-game conference slate, then you could just take the top two teams and meet in the conference championship game. Now it sounds like they're going to eliminate that requirement and just say you can have a conference championship game regardless. And so that would open the door for the SEC to adjust its scheduling format ahead of Oklahoma and Texas joining the conference. Uh, right now it's set to be 2025, so still several years away. Uh, but when they get here, that's, that's 16 teams. If you just do divisions, which is something that's still being talked about, uh, you'd probably move Auburn and Alabama over to the east. Uh, OU and Texas would join the west, and so would Missouri uh, to just make geographical sense. Um, but then in that scenario, you've got 18 divisions. If you play every everyone in your division, that's seven games. Even if you move to a nine-game conference slate, you can only play two of the eight teams from the other other division. So you're not you're still kind of in this situation where you're not playing teams for a long time. Like for example, since Texas A&M joined the conference, Georgia has yet to play Texas A&M in College Station. That's crazy. They've been in the conference since what 2012. So you, they want to avoid that. One way to do so is to go to a pod format or go to a three six format where you have basically three permanent opponents and then six rotating opponents. And in that scenario, you can play home and away against every team within a four-year period. So hypothetically, if you're a, a football player who comes and plays through your senior year, you will have made trips to every SEC stadium, even though there's 16 teams in the league. So to me, that one is the, the coolest thing. But by eliminating that requirement for conference championship games, Arkansas could do that, they, or the SEC could do that. They could have four uh, pods or four like mini divisions and uh, they could just you know see the teams you know one through 16 and whoever's number one and number two uh, they could play uh, there in the SEC championship game as kind of the you know even though there's not divisions they could still play and, and I mean technically I guess they could come from the same pod you know if Alabama and Auburn are the top two teams and they're in the same pod they could hypothetically meet up again in the in the conference championship game so uh, really going to be interesting to see how that plays out. The Athletic is reporting that it should be, you know, maybe sometime next month is kind of when the SEC is targeting to get that format kind of figured out. Yeah, and I, I feel like this is something that doesn't just benefit the SEC. We, Of course, we cover Arkansas, so that's what we're going to focus on. But, Alex, you're a Big Ten guy. This is something that would benefit the Big Ten as well. I feel like if, if you look at the Big Ten, usually – you have two teams in a division that are very, very good. And then in the other division, maybe a team, I, I'm not, I don't know the names of the divisions, but I know that this is a problem they've had where you get to the conference championship game and you got Ohio state playing against Northwestern or something. And it's like, but in Ohio state's division, somebody else is probably better than Northwestern. So what's your take on this? Yeah, I think that's absolutely a fair criticism. Um, if you're seeding divisions in college football, it's SEC West and it's Big Ten East, and then there's a huge drop-off, in my opinion, from where you're seeing talented teams come from. Uh, in the Big Ten West, you do have a rotating team like Iowa, like Northwestern, um, and like Wisconsin, who every couple of years will put together a team that can compete at the national level but just isn't quite on the same level as you know the Ohio States, the Michigans, the Michigan States, the Penn States. And it does lead to – oftentimes a, a, a non-interesting conference championship game. Um, you never really go in. I don't know the last time I went into a conference championship game uh, for the Big Ten really thinking that the West had a chance. Um, and that's something that, you know, you'll hear a lot of complaining about, and it's fair. So I do think switching to the pod system and, and having it to where the two best teams get a chance to compete for that championship are definitely fair. 
Um, as far as Hutch was, was saying, though, I, I do think it's important that you have those rotating opponents and you're able to play other teams. I've been here at Arkansas for three years, and I still haven't seen the Razorbacks play a lot of the SEC East teams. Uh, it's just something that's kind of, you know, following a Big Ten school growing up, It's you don't necessarily – think that that's how it works but then you look at it and you're like oh georgia hasn't played at college station since a&m joined in 2012 um it, it's just i'm glad they're doing something to try and combat that all right well we're gonna wrap this segment up and then up next we're gonna talk about some of these freshmen on the football team that we think will have an impact uh michael musselman has a new role we're gonna talk some nil and then later on we'll talk baseball here on the hogbeat hour you're listening to the Hog Beat Hour with Andrew Hutchinson, Alex Trader, and Mason Choate on ESPN Arkansas on HitThatLine.com. Now, here's your host, Mason Choate. All right, we are back here on the Hog Beat Hour. Mason Choate, Andrew Hutchinson, and Alex Trader with you. I want to remind you to go over to Hogbeat.com. That's H A W G B E A T.com. For all of your Arkansas Razorbacks coverage, you will not find any better coverage because there's no better Arkansas sports writer than Andrew Hutchinson, and he is the managing editor at hogbeat.com. So go subscribe, and if you're a student, email Hutch with your edu, .edu email address. It's at andrewhutchinson413 at gmail.com, and uh, you will get it for eleven ninety five a year, I believe, Hutch. Okay, he's shaking his head. So uh, that's a good deal, and I highly recommend it. And then also subscribe to the YouTube. You can watch the, the video version of the Hog Beat Hour there. You can watch the Diamond Hogs podcast, press conferences. Alex breaks down some recruits over there on the YouTube. So it is well worth your time to go check out the YouTube as well. All right, guys, um, let's start by talking about this. So, Hutch, you had assessing Arkansas's early enrollees. Um, you, you had your offense this week, and then you also put out your defense and your special teams um people can go check that out over at hogbeat.com but we're going to talk about that a little bit right now let's start with the offense hutch maybe give give a name um that you're really interested in for this upcoming season on the offense from the early enrollees yeah with among the early enrollees and there were eight of them on offense uh the guy that i think is probably going to contribute the most i don't even think it's necessarily a debate it's rashad debinion the running back from georgia four-star recruit uh, that guy just looked incredibly impressive throughout spring ball. And he was a guy that consistently got praised by Sam Pittman, his teammates. Uh, he's going to be a guy that contributes. So that's, that's saying something considering the, the guys they have coming back at running back. Uh, I mean, between uh, Dominic Johnson, um, between Rocket Sanders, AJ Green, and you've also got KJ Jefferson running the ball. Uh, it's, it's, it's not going to be an easy group to, to crack that rotation, but Rashad Dominion is talented enough that I think he's, he's going to demand carries in the offense this year. And, uh, we're, I think we're going to be really impressed with what we see based on what I saw during spring ball. Alex, you didn't write the article, but I, I would hope you read it. So, uh, what of, of the rest of the early enrollees, you can't pick Dominion. And I know that's a little unfair, but uh, go ahead and throw out a name that people might not expect. Yeah, no, when we were outlining this one, uh, the, the answer was definitely Dubinion. But I, I do think there are some other interesting guys to watch. Uh, Tyrus Washington would be my second pick, I guess, just because of, you know, we didn't necessarily see a ton of depth at the tight end position last season. He comes in, he, he's a big tight end. Pittman, I believe, Hutch, you said, or you wrote said that he was looking about 245 right now. So he's got the size, um, has impressive film, and really, you know, provides just some athleticism at the position. Wasn't necessarily super highly recruited, but also had some big time offers and did, looked pretty solid in the pr spring practices I saw. So I, I guess if you have to go away from Dubinian, who I do think, like Hutch said, could contribute to another four-headed monster for this offense, I think Washington's probably the, the, the second safest choice. All right, let's, let's flip the page and go to the defensive side of the ball, Hutch. You, as I mentioned, you also did a defense and special team story. If you want to read all about all of this and get all the other names and Hutch's breakdown, go to hogbeat.com. But – um, maybe a name from the defense, Hutch. I feel like you're probably going to steal Alex's pick again. But actually, no. Alex, do you want to go first this time? That way you can take Hutch's pick. 
Yeah, yeah, I think that's only fair. I'm going Jordan Crook. Um, I, I said it before. I think I wrote a story earlier on about the the freshman class superlatives, and I had Crook as the guy who I think was most ready to contribute right away. Um, we, we saw Grant Morgan and Hayden Henry both finish their Razorback careers at the end of this season, and there's a whole – um, I don't know if he's necessarily going to jump into that one spot. It doesn't look like he is. You've got bumper pullback. You've got Pooh Paul. You've got uh, you've got some other guys there who are capable who just haven't had the experience. But Crook comes in. He's he's athletic. He was getting those second team reps all throughout spring ball. So I think um, he's someone who you know if, if God forbid an injury happens or or if something isn't clicking at that linebacker position with that core you could see him come in and get some some playing time for that defense all right hutch now you get to go and you cannot pick jordan crook well jordan crook's the obvious answer but here i'll give you another name to to keep an eye on and that would be anthony brown the defensive back uh he's a a safety uh playing that middle safety position that jalen catalan plays uh, don't think he's going to be a starter because you do have a guy named Jalen Callan ahead of him. Uh, but he's a guy I could see maybe finding his way on the field uh, in some situations. I don't know if he'll play more than four games to burn his red shirt. Uh, but if, if he does, I could see him being a special teams guy just because they really like his talent. And uh, he's, he's a guy that I think has the potential, if not this year, uh, down the line of being a, a pretty good player for Arkansas. So Anthony Brown's a guy that I'm going to keep an eye on and, uh, see how he develops uh, throughout fall camp and then into the season. All right. Um, that'll wrap up that talk. If you want to read more, check out the articles that Hutch put up on hogbeat.com. But let's talk about some of these uh, th- these NIL rule changes or whatever they want to call it. I'm trying to see guidance, whatever they're trying to call this NIL stuff that they're doing. Um, we knew at some point that the NCAA was going to try to uh, get in on this and do as much as they could to control whatever it is. Um, what do you know about what they're doing and what they're trying to put guidance on with all this NIL stuff? Yeah, so they're trying to put some guardrails on this. Go figure. They basically turned everyone loose with no rules and said, go crazy, and people went crazy. Uh, and the NCAA just – to me, the NCAA dropped the ball on this. I don't think that's really breaking news uh, to anybody because – the NCAA fought this tooth and nail till the very end. I mean, it went all the way to the Supreme Court uh, and they lost. And so to me, uh, they should have been thinking these things out. They should have known, okay, NIL is coming. How can we make this not the wild, wild west uh, and put some kind of guardrails, some, some guidance, some rules out there. And they didn't. And here we are. And you've got schools that are starting collectives and, uh, things like that. You've got, you know, some big time booster down at Miami that's openly like paying recruits to come there. We saw it with a basketball guy that's like making $800,000 over the next two years. That's just crazy. And to me, I don't have anything against, you know, someone wants to pay these guys, you know, big time money to, you know, come to their, like to once they're there, whatever, but paying players like to convince them to leave their school to come to your school like tampering that kind of thing there needs to be some sort of 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 rules there to prevent that now how are they going to be enforced i have no idea i don't think the ncaa has any idea so i'm gonna it's gonna be interesting to see if this has any impact at all the thing that i get a kick out of is that they're gonna they've said that this is going to be um what's the term like they're go- it's going to apply to to previous people that have, have violated these rules well you didn't really exactly have many rules to begin with so how are you going to enact rules now and then retroactively penalize these schools that have done stuff you should have been on top of this from the beginning and they were not so uh i'm i'm very fascinated to see kind of how this all plays out uh, does it it sounds like the ncaa is only going to go after the guys that were like just blatant you know, violators of the rules. So, you know, Miami be on, be on the watch, uh, some other schools as well. <clears throat> so I don't know. It, it's, it's a mess. I, I, they're going to try to figure this out, but to me, they, they're about, you know, two years too late on getting all this stuff figured out. Yeah. I, I think we all understand that the NCAA is a flawed organization that they, they need a lot of help. And, uh, 
you look at it, and I think right now, from my understanding, is the rules for NIL-related stuff are, like, on a state-by-state basis. So it's not the NCAA that makes the rules. It's the state. And I think what the NCAA wants is they want, like, an overarching, like, encompassing rule from the NCAA for every every school, every conference. And I don't know if they can do that because they aren't, like, a – a governing body they're just an organization and so right now it's you can't they can't make you know these specific states change their rules because like i said it is a state-by-state basis and so that is a as hutch mentioned that's that's something that they kind of screwed up because now you're this far into it and what are you supposed to do you can't just penalize all these people who were technically playing by the rules because there were no rules really so um but you think about it and I, I'm thinking specifically of like Lincoln Riley out at USC now. And I, I've heard rumors of them buying houses and buying cars for some of these recruits coming in. Alex, what do you think about that? Because I think there are ways, there are ways that these people in these organizations are working around NIL and they're, they're calling it like a private booster or a private fund by these people and they're going to donate money or whatever. And that, that's just like to put it on face value and that's not actually what you're doing. You're just breaking the rules. The only thing less surprising than Lincoln Riley playing dirty is USC playing dirty. I mean, we've seen it. Reggie Bush prime example, got his Heisman taken away because USC didn't play by the rules and he didn't play by the rules. Um, It's time and time and time and time again, the NCAA has dropped the ball and you just have to wonder, you know, and we're seeing it a lot now, even with prominent ADs. I know Gene Smith came out and said it not that long ago, Ohio State's athletic director. College football may have outgrown the the NCAA. I mean, there may need to be a different rule set put in place because with as big as NIL is for the sport and with the way that transfers are working and the way that, that we're seeing everything unfold and rapidly change over these last couple of years, someone competent needs to be in charge. And Mark Emmer isn't that guy anymore. And that's a very good thing for all of college athletics. But you need someone who's focused on with with as big of an enterprise and as much money as college football brings in for these schools and for these networks as well. You need someone competent who has time to just focus on college football. I wouldn't be shocked if we see that kind of become a reality here before too long in that these these centers and these athletic directors realize what their cash cow needs and take action towards that. Um, as far as right now goes, it is, like Hutch said, the wild, wild west. And going back and, and punishing schools for breaking rules that didn't exist is insane. That would cause an uproar and you'd have riots in the street if you see schools like Alabama, like Georgia, like Ohio State have repercussions for actions that were legal at the time. You'd have you'd have big, big problems if, if you're the NCAA there. So it is fine tuning and they drop the ball again. There's really no other way to put it. You're seeing schools recruit or boosters are recruiting kids that coaches don't want. And when you're seeing that, there's really you you have to take a look in the mirror and realize that something went wrong along the way. Yeah, no, I, I think that you kind of hit the nail on the head there. It it's creating just a different way to go about things, especially recruiting. I think we all understood that once this happened, recruiting would change, even though you, you might want to say that they're not using it to recruit. And the universities will tell you that they're not they're not telling these recruits when you come in to for a visit or whatever we can give you this much money on an nil deal we can get you this nil deal as much as they say that i will not believe that they're not doing that because that is that is like that 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 is a pitch that you can make that will get somebody on your campus and i i just refuse to believe that they're not doing that but we don't have time to keep going into this we can talk more about it next week or something but we gotta we gotta hit a break because we gotta talk basketball we got some michael musselman um, news and then we also have to talk about Nick Smith Jr. There's some stuff with that and then we'll talk baseball later on here on the Hogbeat Hour. You're listening to the Hogbeat Hour with Andrew Hutchinson, Alex Trader, and Mason Choate on ESPN Arkansas on HitThatLine.com. Now here's your host Mason Choate. Okay, we are back here on the Hogbeat Hour 
And we're going to talk some basketball. As we know, it is a slow season for basketball, but a few things happened this week. So uh, Michael Musselman promoted to a new role on the basketball staff. He is now the director of basketball operations. Hutch, what does that mean? And what, I mean, what is he going to be doing differently from what he was doing? The way I look at it, the way I read it is that it's going to be a lot of the same for, for Michael Musselman because he was already the assistant director of basketball operations this past season. Uh, he was helping out Anthony Ruda. And of course he was the director of basketball operations until he got promoted last month to a full-time assistant coach on the court. Uh, so, and he was, and previously Michael Musselman was the, just the director of recruiting and uh, the press release given out by the U of A the other day uh, said that he's going to still, you know, handle recruiting duties for Arkansas, uh, but also take on kind of the day-to-day running of the team. I know Anthony Ruto was big on, uh, you know, the schedule, finding, you know, putting together the non-conference schedule, things like that. I don't know if, if Ruto is still going to be involved in that or if it's all going to be Michael Musselman, uh, but it sounds like he's, he's just kind of adding another role uh, to his duties uh, that he was already – pretty much doing as the assistant director of basketball operations this past season. Uh, you saw talking when I was cleaning my glasses. Um, okay. So in uh, other news, so Nick Smith jr. Moved up to the number one recruit in the country on a particular other website. I don't know Hutch, if you want me to say the name of that website, it, it but, was 24 seven. It's okay. okay. Everybody, everybody knows that. So, Nick Smith Jr., he is now number one in the country, according to 247. According to Rivals, he's number two in the country. Um, so that is uh, – that's what happens over at hogbeat.com. But, I mean, what, what does this mean? It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big deal for Arkansas. You get the number one recruit in the country, according to 247. Yeah, I mean, it's just a, a really big deal for Arkansas. Number one, number two, wherever you have them. I think ESPN has them at number three. Uh, that, that's a big deal because that means he is one of the premier top players in the country. And how many times have you heard of Arkansas getting a player like that in any sport? I mean, there, there have been some big-time football players. There have been some big-time basketball players. I mean, Bobby Portis was a five-star. Uh, you know, we can talk about football. You know, McTelvin Aguin was a, a five-star. Uh, baseball routinely gets, you know, high-profile big-time guys, but a lot of those guys don't ever make it to campus. And even those that do, they probably weren't considered the top, you know, the top five players in the country. So uh, this is this is a big, big deal just from a publicity standpoint. You know, we saw Eric Mossman all over Twitter yesterday uh, when 24-7 made their announcement. Uh, and and really, it the, the only other time that Arkansas has had a guy of this kind of caliber that that came and signed to Arkansas, his name's Corliss Williamson. Uh, he worked out all right. So if, if you could just, if Nick Smith can just do half of what, <laughs> what Corliss Williamson did, of course, he's probably only going to have one year to do it while Corliss was here for three years. Uh, then I think Arkansas fans will be really happy with, with what they get out of Nick Smith Jr. Yeah. Real quick before we go, Alex, I want to ask you, you're, you went to Bentonville, right? Bentonville West. Bentonville West. Yeah. Okay. Um, I saw on the timeline on Twitter, people were talking about the whole Malik Monk thing, how he kind of messed with Arkansas and used Arkansas. I'm not going to make a comment on that. That's just what I read. But for Arkansas to get a guy and not have him go to a school like Kentucky or Duke or Kansas and to keep him in state, Nick Smith Jr., how big is that? Uh, I mean, you don't want to say it's a changing of the guard because that might be a little extreme. Those teams are still dominating college basketball, but it might be a promotion for Arkansas to the national stage. I mean, and being able to to bring those prime time guys in, like Hodge said, it's a big deal to bring in one of these top five players in the country. 99% of schools aren't going to be able to even come close to that ever. And, and being able to do it right now with a roster that, you know, has kind of been overhauled, but did make the elite eight in back-to-back years. It's a huge deal. And then pair it with the rest of the class that, that Musselman's bringing in. Um, I think if you're an Arkansas basketball fan, you have to be really, really optimistic about the way things are going at Arkansas. And um, I think Muss is a huge reason for that. All right. Well, that's going to wrap up our basketball talk. Up next, we're going to talk baseball. Vanderbilt coming to town this weekend. And we'll get to that on the Hogbeat Hour.
You're listening to The Hog Beat Hour with Andrew Hutchinson, Alex Trader, and Mason Choate on ESPN Arkansas on HitThatLine.com. Now, here's your host, Mason Choate. All right, we're back here on The Hog Beat Hour. Mason Choate and Andrew Hutchinson here with you to talk some Razorback baseball. Um, later on in this segment, we're going to have a, a, a clip from the Diamond Hogs podcast of our interview with Matt Goodhart. Um, if you want to hear more of that, you can go find the Diamond Hogs podcast on the Hogbeat YouTube, the full version, the full interview, and you can also find it on the Hit That Line podcast network. But before we get to that, Hutch, you and I, we got to talk about some stuff, some updates that we got from Dave Van Horn on Thursday. Uh, what was your biggest takeaway from his press conference? Just about uh, updates on Arkansas. I think we heard Stovall, he's good to go. Just what, what did you kind of take away from that? Well, the biggest thing I wanted to know going into it was kind of how Hagen Smith is health wise. Um, you know, we, we remember Dave Van Horn mentioned after his start on Saturday that his below was a little bit down. I had noticed it at least, you know, on the broadcast and who knows how accurate those readings are that it seemed to be down the last couple of outings, maybe at Texas A&M and then again against uh, Ole Miss at home, uh, maybe not quite as bad against Ole Miss. And so you're, you're wondering like, oh gosh, is there some sort of arm injury? This is a guy that has had Tommy John before, uh, but it sounds like uh, he's, he's good to go, that it was literally just a mechanical issue that, that he and Coach Hobbs kind of got in the bullpen and, and figured out. So that was really good to hear because if, if they can get that figured out and he's, you know, throwing with the normal velocity he was earlier in the year, uh, then I think he could be a, a really good you know, number two starter for Arkansas. And you really need that uh, for the uh, postseason, which is just around the corner. Yeah, so that's that's another thing is postseason's around the corner. I know you asked, Dave, about the RPI update. So Vanderbilt, they're number four in the RPI rankings going into this series. Arkansas, they were 20 earlier in the week. Now they've dropped down to 21, even though – Coach said that he believed that they went up after Ole Miss beat Southern Miss, but so they're 21, Vanderbilt's four going into the series. How do you feel about that? I feel like that's something that you've been looking into a lot recently. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great opportunity for Arkansas, and they need it. It's it's probably a good thing that they have a, a series like this against Vanderbilt at this point of the year, just because they need the boost. Uh, they really need to probably, in my opinion, to be a top eight seed, need to get in that top 15 range to feel comfortable. Uh, I mean, I know he seems to think that Dave Van Horn seems to think that winning the West uh, should be enough. And I agree personally, uh, but will the selection committee vary from that RPI ranking? They don't usually, uh, but if any team that's kind of earned that, you know, benefit of the doubt, I think it's Arkansas, just like Kentucky basketball, just like Alabama football, maybe Arkansas gets that kind of benefit of the doubt from the uh, selection committee. So as far as this series with Vanderbilt goes, how do you feel? You, I mean, Vanderbilt, they're having somewhat of a down year. Um, Arkansas, they've struggled a little bit. It feels like they've gotten hot recently. Are you feeling good about this series for the Hogs? I like the fact that it's at Mom Walker Stadium. I think it's going to be a great environment uh, to play in for Arkansas. It should benefit them. But, man, I think it's going to be a tough matchup. I know uh, Dave Van Horn uh, was talking about they were pretty sure that Vanderbilt's going to be starting a, a freshman lefty on Friday, first SEC start, first SEC appearance. The fact that he throws left-handed is kind of worrisome, but he's a guy that's only pitched on midweek so far. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be a challenge. And they've also got another lefty in the rotation. I think two of the three starters are probably going to be left-handers. So that gives me a little bit of uh, worry and a little bit of hesitation uh, but the fact that it is a bomb uh, should give you some level of confidence uh, for, for this weekend. Well, the first two games, Friday, Saturday, 6.30, Sunday, 2 o'clock, they're all on the SEC Network Plus. I know that you're not happy about that, Hutch. If you want to say something, if you want to cuss, go ahead. Here's your time. Uh, just at this point, you know, turn on, figure out how to work the SEC Plus. I mean, it, at least we've got that option. There you go. All right. Well, we're going to get into this interview with Matt Goodhart from the Diamond Hogs podcast. So that'll do it for us here on the Hogbeat Hour, but enjoy this clip from the Diamond Hogs podcast. All right. We now welcome on friend of the program, Matt Goodhart. Excited to have him back on. Now, since the last time we talked to you, Matt, you've been a lot more active on Twitter. You've kind of been going at some of the haters on Arkansas baseball. So what's that about? And uh, I guess for a lot of us, thank you for doing that. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I don't know the, really the answer to what it's about, but um, 
I guess it's more so in defense to the program and to the players and coaches that are a part of it. You know, I mean, first off, I'm, I, I try to be as positive of a guy as I can possibly be. I just think that positively impacting those that are around you is, is the secret to life, if you will. You know what I mean? But, um, you know, I, I just don't think that the hate for the, you know, that I see on the program, the hate towards the coaching staff, the hate towards the players, I just, I find that unacceptable from a fan, you know? especially only in the only in this case because they are succeeding and they're successful you know they're playing they're still playing at a high level you know they like you said um before it's kind of the fan base has become spoiled in the sense because of how successful the program has been in the past and you know i i, I have taken a little more to social media in regards to voicing my opinions too because it seems like people are interested in what players and players that are still a part of the game have to say and you know and whether they agree with it or not sometimes they just want to hear what you know what it is and you know I'm very open to that especially if people are respectful and even if they even if they disagree you know if they're respectful about it and go about it the right way you know that even you know that that affects me that allows me to see other perspectives and you know, make, make as good a decisions in life as I can possibly make. Matt, so you told us, um, or you, you mentioned just now that, that they've been playing at a high level. They're winning games. Big, big series win this past weekend on the Plains in Auburn. Uh, do, you, do you watch any of that? Do you have any big takeaways for us? Yeah, I watched most of the first two games. I was unable to watch most of the Sunday game because we had practice, but um, big takeaways. Man. My biggest takeaway, I guess, would be that if the Razorbacks play, you know, to the level of their capabilities, you know, if they play their game, if they don't, you know, if they don't sink down below their level of play, they're a really, really, really good team, really solid defensively, really solid on the mound, and even really solid at the plate. And just because they haven't hit to the level that they're capable of in the past doesn't mean one doesn't mean that they're not a good hitting team and two does not mean that they won't get hot later in the season either you know you think of like you think of the teams from the postseason last year like Nebraska and NC State and go and look at their their numbers prior to the first you know the first half of the season even the first three quarters of the season before before the postseason and like they, their numbers weren't anything to write home about, you know, and and then we go and play them in the postseason. And I don't have to remind everyone how good those teams were and how solid they were whenever we played them in the postseason. And I, I think that just goes to show how quickly things can change for starters and two, show that it doesn't, not that it doesn't matter earlier in the season, but what matters is if you get hot later in the season. And that that leads you a lot further than a midweek loss in the middle of the season. So uh, I want some perspective from you. You've played under Dave Van Hoor. You know, you know his mindset, his philosophy. So I, I've I've been looking at the corner outfielders, Gregory, Lanzilli, Borifin, and it's not just those guys. Dave Van Horn, he's been mixing the lineup a lot, trying to figure things out, but what is it about him and how he tries to figure out the lineup? I mean, do you know what his philosophy is? It feels like it's a lot of matchup based. Yeah, he is. Uh, he does tend to lean matchup wise uh, pretty heavily, and he doesn't just blindly do it either. He he tends to look at spray charts, looks at how the you know how the pitcher attacks guys for for one. And also what guys' numbers are against specific specific arms, right? So he mentioned uh, he he mentioned in a um, in one of the pressers after the game about uh, Gregory not hitting lefties well. And all he said was, "Go look at Gregory's numbers against left-handed pitching." I, I don't know what they are, but that tells me that that tells me that maybe Gregory hasn't been picking up lefties real well, despite the fact that he's obviously a good hitter, a great, you know, he's a great teammate and a great player, but 
maybe the numbers show that Leach or whoever pinch hit it for him against a left-handed pitcher in that position is probably probably the way to go, you know? And and that's not always the case, too. You, they, I believe they mentioned over the weekend, too, that Kendall Biggs is hitting left-handed pitching better than he's hitting right-handed pitching. You know, it's never – it's not a one-size-fits-all, and it's never – it's never, you know, the same case for every single guy, right? And as of late, you know, it, it's individual to the hitter, it's individual to the pitcher, and it's individual to the coach and the and whoever you have on the bench that can come in and get the job done too, you know. Not not many programs like Arkansas have the luxury to bring in a guy like Lanzilli to face a left-handed pitcher in the seventh or Dylan Leach or and vice versa, bring in Gregory or – bore up and whoever the case may be you know coach van horn has a good problem on his hands that's that he has 11 or 12 guys that can hit in any situation you know you, you think about it like last year charlie welch that guy can really 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 hit and he starts in every other lineup in america if you ask me you know it's just one of those things where he, he, he's he got, you know, up to his ears and great hitters and great players. So he can kind of pick and choose what he does with guys in certain situations based off the numbers. So uh, you mentioned that Zach Gregory press conference question. That was actually mine. I took the brunt of that answer. Um, I did look it up. He was hitting two for 18 against lefties at the time. So understandable, 111. Now this brings me to the next question. You recently tweeted about uh, batting average and asking, is it the most overrated statistic in baseball? Um, I think I think it's up there. I think you made a really good point. Uh, my question to you is, what would be a better stat to measure a hitter's effectiveness without getting into like safer metrics, I guess? Okay. Oh, that's a good one. Um, well, for starters, the reason I do think I don't know I, I don't know if I would say it's the most overrated statistic. I feel like that's fair. You know, I had a guy comment say maybe wins and losses for a pitcher, that kind of thing. I understand that. That's fine. Good point. Um, I think it is a little overrated too, just because of the points that I've made regarding it is, you know, a three, a 300 batting average in the SEC is not the same 300 batting average in NAIA. That's just the way it is. And that's no knock on NAIA, but the pitching that you see in SEC is unbelievable. It's unreal. It's as good a pitching as I've ever faced. And, you know, if you're hitting 300 in the SEC, that says a lot about you as a hitter and how high level of a hitter you are, right? Whereas 300 at different levels may not delineate that. So I think, but that being said, I do think that there are some other good statistics that, that show how good of a hitter is. One of the, one of them that's not really kept that I like to keep is called just quality of bat percentage. Um, it's kind of coined by a guy named Steve Springer. He's the mental coach for the Toronto Blue Jays. He's a good dude. Um, basically, just keeps up with if it's whether or not it's an at bat that helps the team or an at bat that's competitive, pretty much. And he scores it in an, a number of ways. It's basically a percentage like a batting average, but it's um, if you get on base somehow, if it's a hard hit ball and hard hit being relative to what level you're playing at, obviously. Um, and I believe it's five, five or more pitches in the at bat or two, two or more after you get to two strikes or something like that qualifies as a quality at bat. And I feel like that, that really shows, shows guys that are consistently having good at bats. I think that that says a lot. Um, of course you can always go with on base percentage, uh, on base plus slugging, those kind of things. Um, I think those show. Have, show a little more context than just simply batting average personally I think that's that's a good point there because I a guy that comes straight to my mind is Robert Moore I mean you look at his average you just look at the stat sheet and it's like what is wrong with Robert Moore why is he not hitting but it's almost every at bat I mean he's fouling off two three pitches he's seeing five six pitches every at bat and even if it ends up in a strikeout or a fly out or a foul out what you're saying it would still be qualified as a quality at bat so I, I think that's interesting um <clears throat> another guy I want to ask you about is Brady Slavens because you kind of you you hit on him a little bit on Twitter um I I think that a lot of people have noticed 
with Brady Slavens, I don't know if it's just the way he swings or what. It does look like he's swinging for the fences every swing. But you said that's not the case. So what is it? Because, I mean, he he just – does he just swing that hard? So, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of hard to uh, – this is kind of a loaded one. It's going to take me a minute to explain. So, everyone, bear with me. With less than two strikes, hitters at the level that – at the – at Arkansas, that high of a level of play, with less than two strikes, our intent is to do damage, whether that's whether, – whether you want to use the verbiage swinging for the fences, try, whatever the case may be, it, we're, we're trying to do damage. We're trying to hit the ball and hit it really hard, you know, because the last thing we want to do with less than two strikes is to slow our bats down and not create solid contact, Right. Because if we have less than two strikes, you know, it's the ball's in our court. We're not going to strike out with one swing, right? So the, the goal is with less than two strikes, we're trying to do damage. And the issue that I had with Todd Walker's phrase, is, there's two parts of it that I have problem with. One, of, one is which you can't infer that he was trying to pull it to the right side, right? Now – it may have appeared that way, and sometimes it does appear that way, but that's not necessarily the case. You know, there can be a mechanical breakdown somewhere that makes it appear that that's what's going on, when in reality, it's just a mechanical breakdown. And he's trying – there have been cases for myself where I've tried my very hardest to, you know, to sit back and hit one hard the other way, and I swing over it or swing and miss, and then you hear a coach say, hey, stay on it, don't pull off, try to go the other way with it. Well, coach, I, I was, believe it or not. I know it didn't look like it, but that's what the that's the goal that I had in mind, right? So in that case, that specific verbiage didn't work. But another thing too, um, dang, I kind of lost my train of thought. The part where the part with the slump part of it, right? It's kind of like my last year at Arkansas. I went through a skid where I didn't have any hits, and this kind of ties in the slump part to the batting average part is. Everyone in for, you know, they talk about a slump and it's always relative to your batting average. When in reality, a guy could go 0 for 25 and hit 20 balls right on the screws, right at someone, and he has nothing to show for it. And then also has 10 walks to go with it. To me, that's not a slump. That's not struggling in the slightest. That's just unfortunate that you're hitting it where they happen to have eight guys positioned and also having good at bats to walk. That guy's quality of bat percentage could be 80%. Eight out of 10 of his at bats are quality of bats, yet it's being portrayed as an 0 for 25 slump. That doesn't make sense to me. And that's kind of that's kind of the point that I was trying to make on Twitter with, you know, it's it's hard to condense that into one tweet, obviously. <laughs> 